It's really a delight, Matt Pruitt, uh, to have this conversation with you um, and to talk a little bit about this very interesting idea of uh, partial common ownership and where it comes from. So what I'd like to do is really start before we get to partial common ownership to sort of understand what it's embedded in, what's what's the larger set of issues that it, are raised for you and that partial common ownership is partially a solution for. So I know that, that there are a couple of concerns that as we've talked about these issues over time are very, uh, that you feel. One is that there is a problem with liberalism as we currently construe it. And another is your desire to achieve legitimacy in any kind of new institutional arrangement or problem solving um, that you engage in. So why don't we start with uh, liberalism? Um, and maybe you could tell me a little more about what you mean by that term, where you see the problems lying, and uh, we can go from there. To me, the core of the of the concept of liberalism has to do with the constraint of power, basically. It, ha it has to do with, with the idea that that is, you know, we want a certain relationship between between authority and between you know the the parties that are subject to the authority. Um, so I look to a couple of principles that Ronald Dworkin um, laid out as a as a pretty good guide to like the core of the concept of liberalism. Ronald Dworkin, the philosopher, right? Ronald Dworkin, the the legal philosopher. Um, uh, his he so he gives sort of two two principles uh, as the core of liberalism, which are both kind of directed at um, the, the sort of the problem of uh, the legitimate use of coercive force by a government against its citizens. So I'll, I'll lay them out briefly um, and then we can kind of talk about them more. I actually don't fully sign on to both of them, but I think it's a great place to start. The first principle is that coercive power is illegitimate if it is not um, uh, motivated, if it is not you know, guided by basically equal concern for all of the uh, persons that are subject to, to the power, right? So this sort of criterion of, of equality or equal concern. And then the second principle is, is the idea that coercive power is illegitimate unless it respects the right and responsibility of every individual to decide uh, for themselves uh, what would count as success, what would count as a good life, what would count as the good. So to me, these two principles, which both have to do with the kind of, uh, with sort of constraining the exercise of coercive government power are the, are really the, 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 the core of it. And the, these, these ideas are more abstract and they cover most of the different sort of particular conceptions of liberalism that, uh, that people talk about. Great. Okay, so what is your critique of liberalism then, and how does property fit into that? I'm not sure if it's a critique of liberalism or if it's critique of like a misconstrual of liberalism, um, but but basically um, basically I I worry about how liberalism has been applied in practice uh, because I uh, I think that many governments and many societies that consider themselves liberal have sort of excessively relied on a few different kinds of institutions to like instantiate their commitment to liberalism. And one of the most important uh, of those institutions is the institution of, of property, right? So the idea of the idea of private property kind of seems to express these two principles because it has this sort of quality of neutrality, right? It has this, this quality of, of uh, um, you know, property rights themselves uh, you know, it's kind of easy to make them formally uh, apply equally to everyone in a polity. Um, and, and property rights themselves also seem to kind of not put their thumb on the scale of, uh, of any particular conception of the good. Um, and you can make a similar statements, I think, about other sorts of economic institutions, such as, um, such as money, right? Money also seems to have this kind of neutrality this kind of quality of not respecting or favoring some groups over others. 
and not embodying any particular conception of the good. And therefore, I think that you know many uh, many thinkers who have thought of themselves as liberal have understood these economic institutions like property and money as compatible with a liberal ordering of society. And that is um, that is the core of my worry. It's the core of your worry because you don't think of them as neutral. It's not just that they're not neutral. It's more that they don't actually uh, embody, you know, these values. They don't uh, express equal equal respect for for everyone. And and so what happens is basically the concentrations of power that uh, that form through sort of through these economic institutions end up themselves being sort of sites of illiberalism, right? They they end up being uh, nodes of illi of illiberal power. That are functioning in supposedly liberal societies. I think many liberals basically look throughout society and they look for examples of illiberalism and they try to liberalize examples of illiberalism. And, and I think that what instead, what we should understand liberalism as doing is identifying certain kinds of illegitimate power and constraining those. And, and the, what I suggest as the sort of uh, criterion for identifying that kind of illegitimate power is um, is in this this idea of like compounding power of sort of geometrically exponentially uh, expanding power imbalances between different actors in society. Um, and so this connects very closely to the idea of monopoly. I basically think that like monopoly power is in a sense the problem that liberalism is trying to solve. And I think that's a more precise way of understanding what liberalism should be trying to do than just saying, for example, liberalism is about the constraint of, of government power, of course, of government power. And I think that the, um, the reason that makes sense is because coercive government power is a, a classic example of a monopoly, right? The government um, uses its coercive power to prevent other actors throughout society from using uh, uh, coercive power amongst themselves, right? So it has this kind of compounding uh, effect. Now, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that it, it, we, we, we do want to minimize the amount of coercion that's, that's going on throughout society. But because you have this kind of process that has, that has a potential to reinforce itself, um, coercive government power is dangerous. And like, that's why liberal principles are a valuable guide upon it or valuable constraint on it. So what I'm trying to do is suggest like a different sort of target for the application of liberal principles, which has to do with monopoly. Okay, so that gets us into thinking about uh, partial common ownership because part of, of course, what drives radical exchange is a concern with, creating a set of institutions that are not monopolies, but in fact are radically decentralized often, um, or certainly decentralized um, in terms of the distribution of power and accountability. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how one property has become a monopolistic problem and then how partial common property ownership is a way around that. Partial common ownership is is a a way of kind of re reconceptualizing or redesigning property rights that tries to draw a clearer line between the kind of power that property rights uh, between the sort of political power that property rights give and the non compounding less presumptively illegitimate uh, sorts of economic power or, or power to you know to steward assets or manage assets or, or resources right so. We're, it's it's about trying to distinguish between uh, the monopolistic aspects of property and the non-monopolistic aspects of property. The way that it works is as follows. Let's imagine in the first case, just a traditional ownership interest over something like land. If you made a partial common ownership interest attaching to that same asset, it would look different. Instead of being sort of one permanent interest, enabling its owner, giving its owner sort of permanent dominion over that land. The idea would be to split that uh, that asset into two separate assets. One of those assets is what you could call a partial common ownership license. Um, the other, we'll call it a residual, and we'll get to that in, later. 
but the a partial common ownership interest uh, works as follows. It's uh, it's an impermanent interest, but it's still an equity. It's still a kind of of, of equity like interest. The way that it works would be if I, if I have the if I have a partial common ownership interest in land, what that enables me to do is it enables me to that entitles me to act like the owner of the land for a particular for a, for a fixed period of time. So it's a kind of a time delimited uh, form of 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 dominion. Um, but I take it it's different than the ninety nine year lease in to British homes or whatever. Yeah, the crucial difference is that is that at the end of that uh, of that time delimited dominion, the asset goes on to goes up for auction. Uh, when it is when it goes up for auction, uh, the the previous owner uh, can participate in the auction and can can bid on it. And it, and if they win the auction, then they if they put in a high bid, then they retain the asset. If they don't win it. Then the asset goes to uh, a new steward, who then has, you know, a sort of a subsequent partial common ownership interest in it. But the key, uh, the key twist here is that the uh, the winning bid for the asset from the new owner goes to the old owner. So, in other words, uh, if the if the value of the land increased during the time that I possessed it, uh, then I proportionally benefit from that increase in the uh in its value and vice versa if if it goes down. Uh similarly like if the if the if the prior owner of the land wins the auction, they then they you can sort of think of them as they would have to pay the money to themselves. So no money has to change hands. They just they just hold on to it. Um, but at the time of each uh, of each auction, some percentage of that winning bid is taken as a as a fee or sort of like a property tax, uh, which which then passes to the uh, to the holder of the residual of, in the asset, um, and um, which is a second asset. Which is a, which is a set which is a second asset, um, and I can talk a little bit more about you know how how that residual uh, works, but. You can already sort of see the dynamic that there's a the dynamic this is creating is is where the license to use assets passes between uh, owners, um, and um, and it may fluctuate in value, and some you know some portion of um, and 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 there's a basically a stream of 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 taxes or payments on the asset. That is constantly being being generated and being passed back to the uh, to the holder of the residual as the asset fluctuates. Now, the uh, the way to think about the residual or the holder of the residual, and I think some of the interesting possibilities with this become clear here, is the idea for the idea is to make the residual um, I something that is collectively held and potentially you know, and either minimally or non transferable. So in the case of, a, of, of an artist creating works, a good way of thinking about this would be like an artist collective. So let's say you have a group of artists who are all creating, uh, creating works of art. Maybe they're young artists, for example, and they don't really know if maybe one of their careers will take off and the other ones won't. Maybe, maybe some of the things that they create will end up becoming very financially valuable, and whereas most won't. Okay, so if they all, if everyone in the collective create, you know, made their art available uh, through partial common ownership interests, then you could imagine the collective being the holder of the of the residual for all of those interests in art. And so what that would mean is that uh, is that the the, the the artist collective would um, would would receive a, a a permanent stream of payments that um, uh, that are generated by these by these artistic assets that are put out there into the world, if some of them explode and become super valuable, then the, you know, the, the, the lion's share of the benefits from that will be divided among the group of, of, uh, of, of artists in the collective. And so what this, you can, it's kind of like a social insurance scheme. Well, can you tell me how this improves upon common ownership? common property ownership 
I mean, why partial common as opposed to common? <laughs> sure. Um, in a way, what it's doing is splitting a false dichotomy that I think has impeded uh, people's creativity in imagining new ownership relations. And that false dichotomy has to do with the idea that if we want to distribute ownership over, over assets, one way of doing that is to is to split the asset into many different pieces, you know, and, and essentially give everyone little fractional shares of a particular of a particular asset. And another way of doing it is to uh, consolidate the you know absolute dominion uh, over the asset in one institution, and then kind of put faith in the ability of that institution to represent the collective interests. I think that both of those. Um, uh, both of those means of dividing power over assets have uh, have problems. They basically both run into the same sort of coordination problem. If we take an, individ an indivisible asset, like a sculpture or something like that, it's a bit weird to imagine lots of people owning little different shares of it, right? Because th then what we're doing is we're we're kind of just financializing it uh, we're not resolving the question about, you know, who gets to put it in their museum or who gets to display it in their living room. We're kind of, you know, potentially inviting uh, complex coordination uh, problems and collective decision problems uh, between the many different owners of, of, of all of the fractions of the asset. Then on the other hand, if we, if we you know, give the asset to the government, let's say, and then um, uh, and then assume that the government is, you know, an accurate representer of the common interest, then, you know, to whatever extent the government is dysfunctional or to whatever extent the government is not actually able to embody or represent the collective interest, we haven't really done what we've wanted to do. So what partial common ownership does is it retains, um, it, it retains this kind of feature of, of assigning a, um, an economic economic actor, the, the ability to manage the asset, to steward the asset, to, to possess the asset, to act like the owner of the asset, and to fulfill many of the, of the functions that, in an ideal sense, asset owners uh, fulfill, uh, without giving that individual owner excessive or unnecessary or unnecessarily permanent power um, over the asset. Got it. But so would you see this partial common ownership as replacing common property in places where there are literally commons? Um, you know, the Eleanor Ostrom kind of? No. Is this an alternative or, you know, a complement to that? No, I think it's a complement to that because it, if you, there are lots of examples of, uh, of assets that are, uh, are held in common or that are managed by some, you know, representative of a shared interest that just work fine. Yeah. And uh, uh, partial common ownership, you know, properly understood, properly applied, partial common ownership should not seek to uh, uh, change that, right? So a, a good example is like a park, right? You know. Yeah. No, um, I was thinking about parks and I was thinking about grazing areas and yeah, right. So there's no reason to use partial common ownership to change the way that, that parks are, are owned because uh, parks work well, you know. So when we have collective institutions that work well, when we have commons and arrangements that work well, there's just this is uh, solving a problem that we don't have. Where this is interesting is where the sort of mentality of private ownership is, is over applied and mm -hmm. where, where our, you know, uh, sort of lack of creativity in imagining alternatives to, uh, you know, individual private ownership kind of, you know, uh, demands, you know, uh, uh, you know d demands an alternative or we can do better. Okay, that leads into my last question, which is, you know, one of the things that this conference is really about is the politics of change. So what is your, how does this all feed into and what is your theory of change here? My theory of change is that um, I think that there are many examples in history uh, of a kind of a lack of creativity preventing us from 
uh, doing more to uh, to vindicate the common good. And um, and I think that we're in one of those moments where we've we have kind of so fetishized the uh, the efficiency and the justice and the and the um, legitimacy of private property arrangements that we just aren't seeing different ways of doing it. Um, now, I think that this this is a different way of doing it that I think is uniquely powerful, uniquely interesting, serves as kind of a, a, a template for um, building different kinds of ownership arrangements um, that do things that other kinds of, you know, common uh, commonsing arrangements uh, don't do. And I think that when we get more experiments with it, when we get uh, when we build more of a critical mass of 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 people and institutional actors who uh, who kind of get this idea and who are able to put it into practice in their um, uh, in in their work in their institutions, you know whether those are artists collectives or land trusts or uh, data coalitions or whatever it may be. There's lots of different sort of domains of application. But we when we start to build a critical mass of of people who um, who deeply understand this idea and are committed to experimenting with it and building on this as a as a as a template for better ownership arrangements, uh, we will start to see more uh, a, a broader understanding of it. We'll start to see some of these arrangements work well. Uh, it will inspire other examples. It will inspire governments to think about uh, you know well you know maybe we. Uh, Maybe we can do better than just sort of, you know, uh, selling the city land to the highest bidder, right? Maybe we can uh, set up a different kind of a, uh, of arrangement. Um, so I think that, my, you know, my theory of change is, um, uh, my theory of change, I, I can't find the right word, but my, my theory of change is that, you know, this is a, a, a better toaster oven. <laughs> and then when people see that it's a better toaster oven, uh, more more institutional actors and organizations that are in position to serve the common good will be inspired to, to take it up and it'll change the way we think about property. Let's hope you're right. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you, Matt. That was a great conversation. Thank you. Really appreciate it.